There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to a special Advent 2023 edition of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a writer, storyteller and English romanticism obsessive. And I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts... Eleanor Conlar. Hello. We've been counting down to Christmas over 12 days of mini episodes, which will culminate in our Three Ravens Christmas special on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. We've chatted through every line of the 12 Days of Christmas song, talking about history and folklore related to each. And now we're at the end. A partridge in a pear tree. Martin, please do the honours. <laughs> Wow, well done. He has gone slightly pink. <laughs> Who thought you could do so many hoes? I know, right? <laughs> so, what is there to say about partridges in folklore? Because, I mean, this whole experiment has been super interesting, but I have to say... Is there a single folktale involving partridges? Well, we've journeyed a long way to arrive at a place... We're not really. Oh. <laughs> you think there would be, what with the whole song ending on Partridge in a Pear Tree. But there's only really two significant partridges in storytelling that I could find, one of which we've already encountered. We have? Yeah. Well, remember when we were talking about six geese a laying and I retold some bits of the life of Daedalus, mostly in the context of his son, Icarus? I do very well. Well, in which case, you might remember Pardex, Daedalus' nephew, who, early on in the story, Daedalus chucks off his roof out of jealousy. Yeah, that sort of kicks the whole drama off because Daedalus is afraid of being caught for murder, so that's why he flees Greece. Well, the myth has it that Daedalus never actually goes to check on the body of his nephew, which could have saved him a lot of grief as, rather than Perdix plummeting to his doom, the goddess Athena takes mercy on Perdix and transforms him into a partridge. Really? A, a partridge of all things? Mm, yeah, it's an interesting choice because for the ancient Greeks, the partridge was a symbol of transformation. They were known to not like being very high up, which is thought to relate to Perdix's fear of heights so they don't fly in the sky and only nest low down. But because Pardix had been transformed from a man into a bird, the Greeks, then many alchemists from then on, saw the partridge as an icon of transmutation and of change from one thing into another thing. How interesting. So did alchemists use the partridge as a symbol? Well, apparently so. And it was believed that because the partridge represents the turning of one thing into another thing, it was also seen as a great bird to eat as an aid to digestion, helping turn all the other things in a given meal into other matter to fuel the body. Well, that's <laughs> very interesting yeah. and very strange too, if oh, you don't mind my saying. It's weird. Because the partridge was for a while one of the most popular game birds in this country. Certainly in the Victorian era, people used to eat a lot of them. Yeah, a lot more than they do now. You don't see partridge in the aisles of Tesco, do you? <laughs> Not that I can think of. <laughs> and you mentioned another partridge story. Yeah, this one comes from the New Testament Apocrypha. So books of the Bible not included in the official Christian canon. This one comes from the Acts of John. The John here being John the Evangelist. And what does John the Evangelist have to do with a partridge? Well... So it said, one day, John is sat having a rest out in the wilderness in between you know, acts of evangelism when a partridge lands at his feet. So John, being a pretty chilled guy, picks up the partridge, which seems to like him, and he just starts sort of stroking the partridge. This is not what I expected. <laughs> so there John is, stroking his partridge, <laughs> when up comes a hunter wielding a bow. The hunter introduces himself, and so does John, but the hunter can't take his eyes off the sight this great prophet sat on a log stroking a partridge. So the hunter asks, why is such a great man like you, a prophet, a philosopher, you know, a wise man, occupying yourself with such a simple amusement? Well, John replies, still stroking his partridge, what are you carrying in your hands? 
The hunter looks down and shrugs and says, a bow for hunting. And why, John asks, don't you carry your bow about always stretched with an arrow notched and ready to fire? Ah, well, replies the hunter, I mustn't do that, for if I did, the constant bending of the bow would warp the wood and my bow would become useless. If that happened and I needed to suddenly shoot an arrow at some beast, the strength of the bow would be lost. Well... John says, look at me with my partridge. And he sort of strokes it a bit more. Don't let this fool you, for my mind is like your bow. For unless by some diversion I sometimes ease and relax the force of its tension, it will grow slack through unbroken rigour. Oh, well, I think that's a bit of Christian teaching we can all take to heart. Yeah. Make time for self-care. Do a bubble bath. Socialise with friends. Talk for the joy of it. Or indeed... Just spend a few moments fondling your partridge. So to speak. <laughs> so, Perdix and John the Evangelist aside, what are we going to do for the rest of the episode? We can't rightly twiddle our thumbs, can we? Oh, never Doesn't that. translate well on audio. Never that. But thank goodness we still have pear trees to talk about. <laughs> but before we move on, I do find it curious that of the seven different birds in the 12 Days of Christmas song, the swans, the geese, the collie birds, the French hens, the doves, the whole thing builds to and kind of gravitates around a bird that doesn't have much going on for it apart from its appearance in this song. I do think we should spare a moment for all the poultry in the song in general. True, there are yeah. 23 birds mentioned, <laughs> all given up by this true love, whoever they are. Yeah, whoever they are. That's a lot of plucking our lead character has to do. That's I true. mean, if she's going to pluck them, she might just be going to keep them as pets. Yeah, fair enough. If you suddenly gave me 23 birds to deal with, I'm not sure what I'd do, actually. Well, there's definitely not space enough in the garden, is there? <laughs> no. So what about pear trees then? Because okay. as we mentioned in the first episode of this little mini series, we spoke about how in some versions of this song, the lyrics are instead of a partridge in a pear tree, but part of a juniper tree. Yes. So I was thinking we could retell the juniper tree, which is a banging folk tale. Well, in terms of pear trees, there are several things to say about them. For example, when we come to the fruit, the pear, it's a shape which many cultures have associated with fertility, particularly female fertility, though in some cultures it is thought to represent the female forms. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, pear trees were only introduced to England in 995 AD, meaning we can definitely date the 12 days of Christmas song from between roughly the arrival of the Normans and the Glorious Revolution. So that narrows the window a little bit. I still feel like you're scraping the barrel a little bit here <laughs> and 700 years is hardly a narrow window. No, that's fair. And the only other thing I've got is that the Greek goddess Hera, also known as Juno in the Roman pantheon, who is the goddess of fertility, was associated with the pear. And again, that's linked to fertility and the shape of the pear, which in some myths is interchangeable with the pomegranate. And is that it? That's it. So, shall we tell the tale of the juniper tree now? Yeah, we can. Not even part of the juniper tree, but let's tell the whole damn thing. Excellent. Well, let's tell the story together. That's always fun. I'll start. OK. Once upon a time... A wealthy yet devoutly religious couple prayed every day for God to grant them a child. Year after year, they prayed and hoped, but to no avail. Then one Christmas morning, under the juniper tree in the courtyard of their home, the wife sat down to peel an apple. Only as she peeled, she thought about how much she would like to be a mother, and she absentmindedly cut her finger. Drops of her blood fell onto the snow and she looked down at them and wished for her child to be as white as snow and as red as blood. Months pass and the wife becomes gravely ill, thinking she's eaten too many juniper berries from the courtyard tree. She asks her husband to bury her beneath the juniper tree if she dies. Yet a month later, it turns out that she was not ill from eating all those berries, rather she was pregnant. She therefore gives birth to a baby boy who is as white as snow and as red as blood. But all is not well, for the wife dies of happiness, holding her perfect infant in her arms. Keeping the promise he made to her, the husband buries his wife beneath the juniper tree. But with all his wealth, the women are soon lining up to try and marry him, even though he is stricken with grief and has an infant son to care for. 
So he has the pick of the bunch and he's soon got a brand new wife who in no time at all is pregnant. She gives birth to a daughter and the new wife loves her daughter dearly but despises her stepson. Another evil stepmother, just saying. True. Still, this particular stepmother is a real rotter. She's endlessly cruel to her stepson, thinking to do away with him once and for all and make her daughter the heir to her husband's vast fortune. So one day, the stepmother shows her children a chest full of apples she's bought. She gives her daughter the pick of the bunch and she leans in, inspecting them and takes one, skipping off to enjoy it elsewhere. But when the stepson leans in to look at the apples, the stepmother slams the chest closed once, twice, thrice, over and over again, only stopping once the boy's head has been cut clean off and he's left stone dead. The stepmother then scoops the head up and binds the boy's body from head to toe in bandages, propping his corpse in a chair in the courtyard with an apple in his lap. The daughter then approaches her brother and thinking it's all a game, she asks him to give her the second apple. He doesn't say anything, but her mother suggests that she boxes her brother's ears to teach him a lesson. She does this, and of course, his head rolls off, making the young girl believe that she's killed her brother and flee in terror. Now, the mother then takes the boy's body, cuts all the meat from his bones and cooks him up as blood soup and black pudding, which she serves to her husband for dinner. When the husband asks where his son is, the wife says he's gone to stay with his mother's side of the family. The husband duly gobbles up the special dinner his wife has made for him, thinking it absolutely delicious. Meanwhile, the little sister gathers up the bones from the kitchen and buries them beneath the juniper tree wrapped in a handkerchief. Time passes, but one Christmas morning, a mist billows out from the juniper tree and a beautiful bird flies out. The bird is the sun, reborn, and it visits the local townspeople and sings about how it was so brutally murdered by the stepmother. And the goldsmith, shoemaker and miller are so enraptured by the bird's song that they offer the bird a gold chain, a pair of red shoes and a millstone to thank it for offering them such beautiful music. The bird then flies home where it gives the gold chain to the father, the red shoes to the sister, but the millstone it saves for a greater purpose. For the stepmother, whose rage at the sun is still not quelled by the boy's death, continues to storm about the house as if haunted. And as she stamps and rages, she goes outside into the snow to get some relief. Flying high above her, the bird then drops the millstone onto her head, killing her instantly. And just like that, in a swirl of smoke and flames, the bird transforms back into the sun, emerging from the juniper tree to reunite with his family, enjoy Christmas lunch and live happily ever after. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? Oh, it's great. I love the combination of horror, birds, cannibalism, Christmas. It's one of those stories that has a bit of everything. It really does. And that brings us to the end of our Advent journey. Or does it? Yes. Well, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that we finished our 12 days of Christmas a day early. And that wasn't just us getting it wrong. It's for a good reason. Yes, indeed so. So quite a few people asked us if we'd be doing a ghost story for Christmas. And we didn't think it right to do a Christmas special with a ghost story baked into it. Christmas Day is a bit more rosy-cheeked than that in our minds. So the Christmas special coming out on the 25th will be all about the history and folklore of Christmas with a suitably cheery story to go with it. But as you know, if you listen to Three Ravens, we do love a ghost story. Mm -hmm. So for Christmas Eve, Martin is going to tell a longer Christmas ghost story he's written. And if you're minded to be spooked on Christmas Eve, then believe you me, this one will tick those boxes. It's so long that we're not really going to do any chat around it. I'm just going to read it. But that will come out tomorrow for those who want to be scared. And otherwise, we'll be back on Christmas Day with our Three Ravens Christmas special. I'm so excited! Me too! Do you think we'll have been good enough for Santa to bring us presents? I hope so, but only time will tell, I suppose. Well, in the meantime, while our partridge is flapped off that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down, derry, 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 down